hello everybody. Welcome uh, to My Security TV. This is episode one of our Security Consultant Insight series. This will be a four-part episode uh, week to week. Uh, today is obviously Wednesday, but next week we're going to start holding them on Tuesdays. Uh, and we're going to be looking at high security buildings, installations and standards. Uh, and uh, today we're joined by Mark Jarrett and we also have Dr. Kevin Foster on the line. Uh, and we'll mm -hmm. hand over to them shortly for a discussion. Um, just as an introduction, uh, my name is Chris, Chris Cubbage. I'm the Executive Editor and Director for My Security Media. And let me just walk through some introductory slides being uh, our first series. And we will put these on our YouTube channel uh, as well. And one of the episodes we will stream out uh, to YouTube live. We're going to be looking at the SCEP requirements, government installations and specifications. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, this session uh, is the first of four. My Security TV, we generally do a Tech and Sec weekly episode each Tuesday uh, on either the GoToWebinar platform or just uh, live on YouTube. We tend to do, say, a 60-minute format. Uh, these sessions are recorded. Uh, we're not streaming today, uh, but uh, from the audience perspective, uh, we have at least 40 or so registered for our first episode, and that will grow over the next few weeks, I'm sure. So if you have questions uh, from any of the experts, please send them in uh, and you also can also do a live chat and you will get an attendance certificate for these uh, automatically. So being if you're an ACES member or you have any certification, I'm sure you can get some CPE, get CPE points uh, for this also. In terms of what we do cover on My Security TV, Aerospace and Space, National Security and Defence, uh, cybersecurity and critical technology and cities and infrastructure. And this series will kind of cover off, particularly on the last two, the cybersecurity and critical technology and cities and infrastructure. Our series experts, and thank you very much for their time. I think if they charge me by the hour, it'd cost me a few uh, hundred bucks for sure. Uh, we've got Dr. Kevin Foster, Dr. David Brooks, Mark Jarrett, CPP, Fraser Holmes, uh, Rachel DeLuca, Sarah Trimboli, and Richard Cathage uh, as well. And uh, our experts are from Perth, Melbourne, Sydney and Canberra. So we do have a very good spread of the Australian security consultant sector. And I mentioned the series focus, high security buildings, balancing fire safety and security specifications and standards and practical completion and compliance uh, issues. And again, really want the audience to drive some of the discussions as well, some of those key questions that you might have. Uh, from the audience, from that 40 or 50 that have registered, uh, we've got uh, various, there are other consultants, but also from the manufacturing sector uh, and some installers as well. So uh, again, we're keen to hear back from you. Um, just some news from My Security Media, the Cyber Risk Leaders magazine is out. There's about 16 uh, articles in there looking at cloud trends, native, multi and hybrid uh, models. So welcome to have a look at that. Uh, we've also been sponsored, so the CISO Online Asia is uh, for 17th and 20th of November, giving that a plug as well. Uh, obviously, being virtual, you can attend even if you're here in Australia. Uh, on the 18th of November, we've partnered with the Australia-Israel Chamber of Commerce over there in Perth. This is probably one of the first hybrid event models that you'll start to see. Uh, this is partnered with Microsoft looking at the AI disruption um, so worth having a look at or attend if you're over there in Perth. Um, so that's pretty much it from the marketplace as well in terms of what I'm going to be plugging. Uh, as I mentioned, this series uh, will is proudly sponsored. Thank you to AMS Australia. And this is kind of what spurred this on. So AMS Australia have their self latching lock monitoring box. Uh, it's a SCEP related product and uh, that that particular brochure is available off the platform to download as well. And we've also got some videos that we did with AMS Australia. Um, I'm wearing some of my COVID kilos uh, in these videos. Uh, I've, ha I've since lost a few, um, but uh, these videos are looking at, just looking at the door hardware bit by bit, uh, both the blocker plates, the, uh, the lever handle and the under door seal as well. Uh, Australian manufactured and designed. So worth having a look at. And at the end of this session, uh, I'll uh, play one of those videos. We've done about four that we've broken down and we'll play part of the series. So thank you to AMS Australia for sponsoring this series. Uh, I'm just gonna walk through what the series holds for you. Episode one today, we're gonna hear from Dr. Kevin Foster. He is on the line. So firstly, let me thank 
uh, Mark Jarrett, CPP, uh, there in Canberra, and Dr. Kevin Foster over there in Perth. Thank you very much for joining us today. Mark, just unmuting himself. Yes, thank you very much, Chris, and I hope that we'll have an enlightening series. Thank you. And uh, Kevin, you're on the line and we'll be joined by you. I'll bring you up uh, shortly on screen once I go through these slides. OK, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so Kevin's going to look at the uh, Handbook 188 project with Standards Australia. Uh, and then we're just going to have a general discussion, again, guided by the audience. If you want to ask a question on what you would like to see out of this series as well, just on the state of play for the SCEC requirements uh, also. So SCEC being the federal government, um, uh, <laughs> I'll read it out, but in terms of uh, the requirements for zone security and physical security uh, as well, and also the products that they certify. Uh, next week, we're going to have almost the full panel. We will have Kevin back, uh, David Brooks and Mark, uh, Sarah Trim Trimboli, Richard Cathed and Cathedge, and uh, Fraser Holmes, just looking at the standards and requirements for high security buildings. Uh, Richard is a fire engineer, so one of the things we'll be covering is that fire safety and security uh, balance, uh, something uh, often uh, can be quite controversial sometimes. And then episode three, the following week, we're going to hear from Sarah Trimboli, David Brooks uh, and Rachel DeLuca. So she just cut off at the bottom there. Um, but each of these three will give a presentation. Uh, Sarah's going to cover off on FISEC 15 and FISEC 16 policies. Um, and then also David Brooks did some work with ACES International on uh, these guide guidelines uh, and uh, guidelines for protecting organisations in intelligent building management systems. Uh, and then Rachel's going to talk about the challenges to maintaining security design integrity after build innovation. Once you hand that over to the builder, and making sure that those uh, installation standards are maintained. So with that one, we're kind of going to lead our discussions up to that. And then episode four, uh, we'll have another sort of expert panel discussion and a series close just looking at uh, smart buildings, smart precincts, and some of those key aspects around that uh, fire safety and security balance as well. So just to introduce our expert panel, Dr. Kevin Foster, uh, he's an Engineers Australia representative on the Standards Australia Committee uh, MB025, Societal Security and Resilience, as well as the Joint Drafting Leader for Standards Australia Handbook 188, Physical Protective Security Treatment for Buildings. And he's also the chairman of the ACES International WA branch and Mark Jarrett, a former customs officer there in Canberra uh, and is now um, board certified obviously with ACES International and a SCEC consultant and is the former vice president ACES International Australia region is currently the v vice, vice chairman, I beg your pardon, of the ACT chapter. So hence uh, you'll get some ACES CPP, CPE points out of this session. Um, Dr. David Brooks and Fraser Holmes uh, will be with us next week. David is the Associate Professor in Security Science at Edith Cowan University uh, and Fraser Holmes, uh, 20, most of us will know in the industry will know Fraser obviously um, and has been around for some time and with uh, Norman Disney Young I believe at the moment as well. And Rachel DeLuca is down there in Melbourne uh, 22 years and I'm just looking for, she won the Security Consultant of the Year, I, I believe, with ASIAL. And Sarah Trimboli, a uh, SCEC endorsed consultant uh, with 17 plus years experience as well. Uh, and she's looking forward to her session on the Australian Defence Security Principles Framework as well and the Protective Security Policy Framework. Uh, and I mentioned Richard is also in Perth, uh, studying with Edith Cowan University as well. Uh, as a, fire, a BCA consultant and fire engineer and uh, looking for, forward to his sites and um, my background there as well. So look, let's dive in to this particular episode. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to bring you on the line and uh, just before I do, this is kind of what we're covering in, from the audience perspective. Uh, we have the SCEC uh, Security Zone Consultant Scheme Policy and Procedures. These are available uh, from protectivesecurity.gov.au. And we'll also be looking at the physical security for entity resources, policy 15, and then entity facilities for uh, policy 16 under the protective security policy framework. So Kevin, what I'll do is, Kevin has some issues with his camera. I'm going to bring up Kevin as a co, in fact, a presenter, just one second.
There we go. <laughs> well done, Kevin. Um, at least you're covering off on the space domain there as well. That's good. We can hear you okay? Just do a sound check for us. Okay, I can hear you, uh, Chris. Right. Okay, look, Kevin, you yeah, walk us through the Handbook 188 project with Standards Australia, probably where it's at and where it's heading, because mm -hmm. and, and also the impact that it'll have uh, on the sector and how it's actually applied. Sure. Okay, thank you, Chris. I'd like to start by explaining the gap in the security standards at present that led to the need for Standards Australia um, uh, to, to develop a project um, for crafting a handbook on building security. We, we call this project HB188. So first let's start by setting the context for identifying the gap in the current standards. Australian standard ISO 31000 2018 risk management uh, which covers guidelines, is our starting point for any risk decision problem that needs to be solved. Risk management provides us with a principle, framework, and a process for managing risk in building design, construction, ownership, occupation, and operation. What I'm gonna do is just sort of show you something that I'm going to use to represent all the different risk management standards. This book's not a risk management standard, but this is gonna represent all the risk management standards, okay? Uh, so when I show you that, I'm talking about all the risk management standards. Okay, there are a lot of them. There really are global. Um, one of the important ones in Australia is not a standard, it's a handbook. It's called Standards Australia Handbook 167, Security Risk Management. That's particularly relevant to Australia. It's a really good handbook. And everybody that's should not, be using that's that. not gonna change at all, Kevin. That, that no, 167 no. will stay there. So 108 is an additional one. Totally different. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah. One eight eight is a totally different one. Okay, so this is that one's focused on security risk management. One of the best risk assessment standards for security anywhere is one called RA.1-2015 risk assessment, which was jointly published by the American National Standards Institute, ASIS International, and the Risk and Insurance Managers Society. If you're not familiar with it, I recommend you search the ASIS International website. Uh, I might be a little biased because I was one of the team that wrote that particular standard, uh, but I do believe it to be really quite comprehensive and probably one of the most comprehensive risk assessment standards around. Okay, so now in my little model, uh, we, we need to have a building that's exposed to risks and the standards necessary to address them. So, so I've got my risk management platform here where all decisions are gonna be based on, on risk management principles. I'm gonna have a building. Okay, so my, my building is going to sit on this risk management um, uh, base, if you like, okay? So, in the Australian building industry, there's a standard of utmost importance called the National Construction Code 2019, uh, which was published by the Australian Building Codes Board. Two of the three volumes of this standard are known as the Building Code of Australia, or the BCA. And the requirements for compliance with it are defined in legislation. From a risk management perspective, a fundamental purpose of this code and the legislation that provides it with considerable power is to ensure that engineering, architectural and procedural safety measures are designed into the building, built into the building, maintained, they use during the operation of the building. It's highly important for every person involved in the design, construction and operation of security measures to fully understand the fire and egress requirements. Security must comply with these. I know that Richard Carthage will discuss some issues here in episode two, so I won't say any more about that now. There are many Australian standards, ISO standards and national standards from other countries, including the UK and the USA, that are very relevant to building security in Australia. Many of these focus on what I would call the nuts and bolts of security engineering. Uh, in other words, various component parts or systems that are built into a building, attached to it, or implemented in operations to provide elements of security in and around a building. For example, uh, standards for lock sets, security glazing, video surveillance, alarm devices and systems, electric locks, associated access control systems, security doors, 
fences, vehicle barriers, and so on. I'm going to use this padlock to represent all those kind of standards. Okay, so I'm going to put my nuts and bolts standards in my my um, building standards box, and I'm going to sit it on top of my risk management standards. Okay, so that's our starting point. All right. There are various other standards and handbooks that provide guidance for building and risk management operations, including human resources involved in providing security, such as guards and other people with security roles. It's worth noting that most of the licensed security consultants in Australia, security engineering designers and installers tend to be compartmentalised according to various skill sets and few have been trained at a level necessary to provide advice on the design of the entire security framework of a building. In other words, who is providing the advice that sets the overall security concept, design and strategy for a building? More often than not, in the commercial and industrial domain, no one in particular. Uh, but lots of different people with different skill sets contributing in a relatively uncoordinated way. Therefore, it can be difficult for a building owner or developer to know who to go to for advice about building security especially if they have no previous experience in working with security professionals. Not surprisingly, the quality and depth of knowledge amongst licensed security consultants varies enormously. Some consultants' knowledge could be limited to that needed to sell an alarm system or a security screen door without misleading a customer. Others could be trained sufficiently to advise an entire corporation or perhaps a major building project team on every aspect of security in a large building or industrial facility. The licensing system is not a professional registration system or even a professional certification system that would more typically set high quality standards for professionalism, sorry, professionalism, knowledge and skill. For example, a global society that represents security professionals, ACES International, has several certifications, including the Certification Protection Professional and the Certification Physical Protection Professional. Unlike the building engineering disciplines, such as electrical, electronic, structural, civil and mechanical, there is no formal registration system in Australia for security professionals that is recognised under any legislation. Is it surprising then that so many building projects have disjointed approaches to security design? No, not really. If, you, if you're a building owner, who are you going to call? So what is missing in our model here? Well, the BCA provides a holistic framework to ensure a building is safe to occupy and get out of in an emergency. We do not have a comparable Australian standard that provides a holistic security framework that describes what is necessary to protect the building and the people in it. For example, from terrorism or some other form of extreme violence such as arson, a shooting or a vehicle attack. So, without a suitable standard ha handbook, how can developers, building designers, builders, owners, facility managers, building insurers and reinsurers possibly determine what is an appropriate standard of security for a whole building? Or even know where to find information that they need to understand building security risk issues and possible solutions that are available. And that brings us to Standards Australia HB188 project. In 2017, the Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation, also known as the ARPC, which is an Australian government agency, submitted a proposal to Standards Australia that there was a need for a new handbook that would be of value to owners and operators of Australian buildings who bear the responsibility for managing the physical risk to their building assets and operations. The intent was not to prescribe security measures, but to inform risk owners. To learn what the ARPC does, you can have a look at their, their website. Um, however, in very simple terms, as an example, if a commercial building owner has a financial consequence that arises from a terrorist attack, there is a process defined under legislation for, for the financial consequences to be transferred through the insurance system to their insurer and then not onto the Australian Reinsurance Board. The HB188 project is proposed by ARPC was approved and in 2018, Standards Australia put out a public call for experts in risk management, security, building designers and engineers, planners, 
resilience management people, business continuity, emergency management, and so on. Many, many different disciplines involved. I can't remember how many people uh, we had initially, somewhere in the order of 40 to 50 people. Okay. I was one of the people who responded to that call. Um, if anyone has an interest in becoming involved in standards development, then these public calls for experts are a really great way to become involved. Many standards are developed by people that have been nominated by large institutions as their representatives. For example, I represent Engineers Australia and the Risk Engineering Society on the development for review of various other security and resilience standards. However, being able to become involved as an individual expert is also an extremely rewarding experience and can generate some interesting and innovative content for a standard or handbook. The HP188 journey began for many of us to develop a handbook through a new and innovative process, quite different to traditional technical standards committee. Apart from the chapter headings suggested by the ARPC that aligned with the risk management standard practice and a very specific scope, we effectively had a blank canvas to start with. We started by collecting a list of references that might be useful, including national and international standards, some highly regarded textbooks, various guides and standards used by national governments, including those published by the Australian New Zealand Counter-Terrorism Committee and others. We then started the process of writing a building security handbook from scratch. It initially started a little bit like writing a Wikipedia entry under each of the headings. I was involved in in the drafting of a chapter on risk assessment, as that is one of my core strengths. Over time, I started to get involved in the collation and editing of the chapter content as it developed. And then eventually my role evolved into broader technical editing and advisory role across the whole handbook. I must, advise, I must emphasize that it was not the intention to draft the textbook of which there are many good ones on the topic of building security, including one excellent one on security science by Clifton Smith and David Brooks those uh, panellists later, in a later episode. I won't go into any detail of the current draft and I must declare that any views I express are my own personal views, not necessarily those of Standards Australia or the drafting committee. However, I would like to acknowledge the hard work by Standards Australia project management staff and many, many volunteer experts involved in the drafting so far that were the HB188 drafting team and also the numerous additional experts that responded to a public call for comment on the draft that was released into the public domain earlier this year. It's probably really important to understand the scope of this particular handbook. It sets the scene for what might come later with other potential standards or handbooks. In HP188, we're not attempting to provide guidance on every conceivable threat possibility or every possible set of physical security measures that might be needed. The scope is far focus primarily on the protection of the building itself, although the draft does consider the broader precinct. It's not the intention of this handbook to necessarily give guidance to the tenants or other occupants within the building. It's generally expected that any physical security measures that a tenant in a major building should need is typically in addition to what is usually called the base building security, which is usually provided by the owner or the building operator. For example, the Australian government has its own security frameworks and technical uh, security standards and specifications for physical security in buildings, and they are world class, no doubt about that. Those might be used by an Australian government agency that is a tenant in a commercial building, or they might be used by a private, private sector organisation or a state government that has entered into an agreement with the Commonwealth that requires them to comply with the Australian government security rules. I know that my co-panellist Mark Jarrett and other panellists you will hear in later episodes are experts in these requirements. Similarly, other organisations may have a much higher security requirement than the base building. For example, banks would have their own internal standard security specifications. HB188 is not an attempt to replicate those highly specialised government or private standards and specifications that are not necessarily transferable to the broad commercial or industrial domain. However, HB188 does attempt to address specific types of physical threats that might be directed at buildings, especially terrorism and other forms of extreme violence. The project is still in progress and we are fortunate to have some world-class technical experts continuing the review of the current draft right now. When this review process has been completed, then hopefully Standards Australia and the HB188 drafting team will be enabled to move forward 
to finalise a handbook and publish it for use by building owners, related risk owners, and all involved in the design, construction and operation of buildings. Many of you would for sure want to know when this will be, and all I can say is that I personally sincerely expect that to happen in 2021, and I hope earlier rather than later in the year. However, I also think it's important to make sure we achieve the goal set for us by the Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation and Standards Australia, which may well be a groundbreaking HB188 base building security handbook for building owners dash terrorism and extreme violence. Obviously, there are many other threats to be considered by many building owners, major tenants, and also we must protect society and the people that enter, occupy and use buildings and surrounding precincts. Therefore, I hope Standards Australia HB188 is just the first step in the develop, development of a suite of similar security standards and handbooks. Thank you, Chris, for the opportunity to speak about the HB188 project. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Um, Mark, have you had much to do with this or did you have a look at the original one that came out? I'm just looking at the uh, release. It came out in sort of March and then the closing for comments was around May. Uh, the handbook was intended for this year as well. Uh, yeah, Mark, have you had, actually had a look at HB 188 or the draft? Uh, it actually only became aware of it less than two weeks ago and um, indirectly, Kevin, and I commend you for your excellent effort on that. Um, it's a, a quite amazing attempt to uh, jam uh, a lot of the received wisdom on protected security into an accessible format for people who are newbies. And I particularly commend you for the utterly exhaustive bibliography and references, um, which would be about a hundred years of reading if you actually went to consult every single one. And uh, on a slightly lighter hearted note, I'd say that for any security newbie who gets their hands on HB188, uh, they'll go, oh, I really do need a security consultant. Yep, absolutely. Mark, just when you just speak, just come forward a little bit. You're a little bit uh, distant there, so thank you. Um, and just for, the, for our channels, I actually interviewed uh, Dr. Chris Wallace, who's the CEO for the ARPC. So if you want to listen to that, that's episode 11. That was back in 2017. And I think that's when he was sort of starting to talk about uh, this and certainly sort of come out. And you don't often hear from agencies like the ARPC uh, either. So they often do that work in the background. So um, yeah, that, that was uh, episode 11. Uh, and I'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, you mentioned sort of the, the duration and the time frame, and Mark's just mentioned the extent of these documents. I mean, these are, it's, it's one thing to have a handbook, it's actually the next is to apply it. Um, how, do you, how do you perceive this will be with, in terms of a body of work with say the 167 as well, with the security management aspect? And then I'm also thinking even on the public spaces uh, strategy uh, for countering terrorism as well. Is there has this become a sort of a suite of documents that you would refer to, or is it going to stand out on its own for the building owners and operators? Well, initially, the intent for HB 188 is that it's a, a, a document primarily for uh, the building owners and operators and the various other people who are involved in the design, construction, operation of, of many different types of buildings. So, to just sort of comment that the sort of buildings that it covers is pretty much. Pretty much any kind of building except for houses and you know and basic sheds and things like that. So it'll cover commercial buildings, industrial buildings, um, uh, retail centres, uh, sort of so a whole whole range of different types of buildings. So it's really quite an important uh, handbook. Uh, it's, it's at this stage uh, deliberately a handbook and not an actual standard. So it's not about telling people you have to have this. It's about informing them because that's the real gap. Um, and the building owners don't know who to go to. The architects don't necessarily need to know who to go to either, or the builders. And so it's about saying, well, here's a handbook, use this as a guide. This is the kind of information you need to do a risk assessment. Uh, and these are the kind of threats that, that were ex the buildings are potentially exposed to. These are the 
the sorts of control measures that you might be able to build into your, your design. Um, and, and clearly you need some people uh, who have that expertise to, to help you. So we think it's a major, major step forward in just guiding people who, who need this stuff, but they don't necessarily know where to go to for information. And so this is incredibly important. We have deliberately got a lot of references in there so that, so that people know there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, and this is one way to bring it all together. We're not trying to replicate any of that. We're just saying it's there. This is where it is. This is where you go and find it. I think down the track, Chris, we will start to see other similar handbooks and standards come out of this. I, I believe this is the first of many. Yep. What, where does it take the security consultant? So how much is in there to find a the suitable security consultant? As you say, there's so many sort of diverse skill sets in being a security consultant, uh, and maybe that's something we might cover off here now as well. And what type of those? What what are some of the the real key uh, skill sets? Uh, because you can be sort of a, a generalist security consultant, you come in from that risk management perspective, but then sometimes really the granular, sort of almost the locksmithing type where, you know, you really need to know what you're talking about before you can make a recommendation. How is it kind of dealing with that uh, broad? Well, what, what we try to do, as well as sort of trying to make it link into the risk management process, we've also shown how it fits into a building design and construction process. So, so at different stages of the building design and construction, you, you need different people involved. Yeah. And so we've tried to spell that out so that, so that you know, during, during the initial concept phase, for example, maybe there needs to be somebody on board who can, can help you through the risk analysis, the risk assessment, set some you know, broad strategies, you need protection around the building, you need protection in the common areas, that sort of thing. And starting to develop that strategy that then starts to get into the architect's conceptual design and the engineer's conceptual design. There's a lot of engineering that needs to support security. In that. Yep. So you know, there, there are a lot of people who have to get involved pretty early on. So this is giving that guidance right up front from the very beginning before before it's even being built out of the ground. And then at every stage of the project, until the building completion, and then the developer might decide to sell it to an owner, the, to a new owner or a group of owners, they can then look at what, what they have. They then got this, this document that says, well, these are the sort of things that need to be there. Show me that you've got them. You yeah. know, so it's going it's to help from an every auditing perspective, single yeah. stakeholder. Correct, yeah. so it's going to be really important at every step of the project of the way. And of course, as I mentioned in my presentation, you do have all those other little nuts and bolts type things that need to be dealt with, all the things that bolt in, like the locks and the, and the alarm systems. And, and so there are other people that get involved. Is it covering off, and uh, to be honest, I haven't read it um, or seen it, so I'll try to get my hands on it, but is it covering off on, when you say extreme violence, on explosives and, and blast resistance as well, or more a physical attack? It's covering off on, on all types of, of, of extreme violence. So yes, we do have some information in there about uh, explosives, uh, about uh, vehicle attacks, about arson, about shooters, you know, sort of a, the, 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 all the sorts of things that might oh, happen in, in any form of extreme violence. Um, uh, the HB 188 itself is focused on the protection of the building because we need a different handbook for the protection of the people, okay? But, and because this has got a slightly different purpose, but as I said, this is the first in a series. Now, um, however, many of the security measures that we put in place to protect the building will also protect the people. So we've been very, very conscious of that and we tried to, tried to do that wherever we can. So, um, you know, so for, for example, if you put bollards outside the building to protect from a vehicle attack, we, you put them in a position where the people can escape to a relatively safe place. So yeah. even though we're using the bollards to protect the building, it's protecting the people at the same time. Correct. Okay, and we obviously still refer to sort of British standards in that often as well. So we don't really have uh, that type of, we have our own guidelines and the like, but uh, nothing like that in terms of a handbook. Mark, I think I'm just conscious of time and uh, thank you very much for that, Kevin. Um, I Mark, I think just to introduce the audience to the SCEC requirements 
before we move on to episode two. Um, if you could just give an overview of the, the SCEC uh, framework and uh, how that applies, because obviously sort of something like the, the handbook there would be applicable to federal government buildings and, and the like. So uh, there's quite a bit of information on the SCEC requirements, but what's kind of the state of play in relation to that? Okay, yeah, thank you on that, Chris. And um, that's fascinating, Kevin, that you're going to be pursuing the other elements of integrated asset protection for sites, including, as we all know, um, the actual end user operators who have custody and supervision of the assets, operations, um, and whether they be tangible or not. Um, for those uh, who uh, are not familiar with it, the SCEC zones. Uh, well, the Australian government security zones range from one uh, sort of unrestricted public access to zone five for storage of the most sensitive uh, assets, including top secret information and protection of discussions. Um, the uh, uh, procedures uh, and requirements are set out in various documentation in, uh, without taking the wind out of my accomplished SCEC colleague, Ms. Kimberly Sales, she's going to speak on SISSEC 15 and 16 from the Protective Security Policy Framework. All of those documents are publicly available at the protectivesecurity.gov.au website. Um, and there are also much more detailed requirements, uh, which basically set out how the Australian government says uh, and it is approved by the Security Construction and Equipment Committee, the Standing Interdepartmental Committee, uh, how government operations, information, equipment, and um, reputation and personnel will be protected at, at the various sites. And the nature of the zones required with a zone one to five or any uh, compartments therein are dictated by the type and nature of the asset. So um, one, uh, and also supported by various other detailed technical guidance and documentation that is uh, given authority by the Protective Security Policy Framework, um, including FISSEC 15 and 15, uh, 16 for physical security, various personnel, information and uh, related security requirements and for the SCEC or Security Construction and Equipment Committee approved security consultant of which there are currently about 80 globally because um, some are offshore at the moment. Uh, what we work to, to ensure that the zones that are created are compliant and can meet the uh, minimum standards for accreditation and certification. Um, one of our Bible documents, if you like, is the ASIO technical notes, uh, one of 15, which is zones uh, basically one to four, and then five and 12, which is top secret zones uh, for zone five. And there's various supporting bulletins, circulars, and guidelines which support all that. Um, for example, uh, any zone three to five must have either a class five commercial grade or type 1A ASIO SCEC endorsed security alarm system, and that must be uh, commissioned and certified compliant by the SCEC consultant and only the SCEC consultant issuing a certificate of commissioning and compliance uh, as required by ACO T4 Protective Security Circular 148. So that goes together with a compendium of the details, the operating manuals, the as installed drawings for devices, warranties, whatever, operate, whatever else you have in sort of a security compendium retained on site. Uh, for that particular secure zone or facility. Um, supporting that too, there's the security equipment guides for the ASIO T4 SCEC testing program recommends commercial grade devices of various sorts, which are nevertheless suitable for use in Australian government installations. 
Um, one example of that is uh, uh, cross-cut shredders for destroying hard copy information. The old security, ASIO security equipment guy had hundreds of pages of tested and accredited cross-cut shredders, and they thought this is a bit of a waste of paper. So they put the requirements into a security equipment guide, and there's various other guides where the equipment is not specifically tested by brand, make, and manufacture by ASIO, but um, they tell you uh, how you can select a good commercial equipment that will still meet Australian government security zone requirements. Um, the main um, equipment content of the actual stuff uh, which is continually tested by ASIO T4, which covers a range of equipment, uh, is the simple or security equipment evaluated products list. And that's periodically updated by ASIO T4 as they test and certify and accredit uh, various types of security devices and equipment. For use in Australian government secure zones or providers to government that have to meet the Australian government um, zone requirements. And of course also all the zone requirements do rely on, as Kevin touched upon, uh, the commercial standards. Um, SCEC uses commercial standards and you can create a, a compliant secure zone with commercial grade equipment. One example being a class 5 AS2201 compliant intruder alarm system for zone 3 areas, uh, but that has to be accredited and commissioned uh, as if it was a type 1A uh, high security alarm system, of which there are only two currently, Doher and Honeywell. So, um, of course, we do use Australian government standards once a week, uh, uh, so we use commercial standards after the minimum Australian government requirements zone guidelines have been satisfied uh, and then we do go as Kevin and the HB 188 team have acknowledged with their bibliography uh, other government standards which may apply as well for instance the UK standard for say vehicle bad and crash rating resistance and there's various other examples like that so um, as far as it goes, the SCEC program is under review. The ASIO T4 sort of comments on the eligibility and training and qualifications requirements in about July, and um, they're currently considering that. And uh, they may be changing the requirements, um, but I'm not exactly sure what they're up to with that. Uh, but the main thing is that it's a set consultant uh, under Australian government current policy must uh, be used for uh, any area which will contain or be covered by a Type 1A security alarm system. Um, and in practice, though, it is wise to engage a SCEC consultant to advise upon the construction, the physical or electronic security, mechanical and electromechanical locking, access control, digital surveillance, on site monitoring and response, security attendance, and all the other elements that you need to actually have integrated asset protection of a particular uh, site, government compliant or not. Certainly, from my point of view, when I work commercial clients, I use the SCEC guidelines and the integrated asset protection concept articulated by the Australian government as the basis for my security advice and designs, supported, of course, by the mandatory requirement for a security risk assessment, which too frequently is overlooked when people say, I want one of those, two of those, and then give me three skiffs as well, without thinking what they have, who might want it, how they can get it, and how they can most effectively prevent or mitigate that, that breach or incident. I think the challenge there, though, Mark, and well done on your audio is not great, but uh, I could hear you, that's the main thing. With only 80 SCEP consultants, and I understand they're not publishing that list anymore, 
Uh, they used to have that on a on a list with about when they, I think there was about 50. Um, there's still a, sort of a lack of sort of qualified SCEC consultants. There's not a lot around, and 80 certainly is not a lot when we think about how many government buildings there are out there. Uh, well, that's exactly right. Uh, actually, the SCEC register is still available, but it's now password protected behind okay. SCEC.gov.au. Um, it's also available on GovDex to Australian government agency security advisors and um, people yeah. like that. But it's funny how it really gets around because I've had contacts from uh, people who should, well, they don't have password access to that register, but they still seem to know who you are. <laughs> yeah, no doubt um, you end up doing a lot of work, obviously, for federal government to come focused on that type of work, as you said. So, look, thank you very much. That was a great introduction, certainly to HB 198 and also to the SCEC framework. Um, I think what we'll do next week, uh, let me bring back, and Kevin, we're going to say thank you to your camera. Uh, so anyone who's got a MacBook doesn't like uh, the GoToWebinar platform. So I'm just going to come back with some closing slides. That way we'll be finishing on the hour. Uh, but thank you very much for that, Mark. I think, Mark, you're going to be Jack back next week, and the same with you, Kevin. Um, and uh, we'll put more to have a broader discussion around where SCEC is at uh, and uh, the frameworks there. So. Let me just bring back the share and also from the audience, um, if you've got any questions that you want to ask uh, before we close, please do. Otherwise, you can email us uh, and we can set them up for next week. So let me just bring back uh, two. And uh, so Kevin's still with us. Uh, and so thank you very much to Dr. Kevin Foster and Mark Jarrett, CPP there. Uh, Kevin's in Perth and Mark is in Canberra. Um, so just to finish off, uh, next week, episode two will be on Tuesday at one o'clock. Uh, we're going to look at matching standards to requirements, and uh, that was certainly touched on today. But we'll have almost a full panel. We'll have six uh, of our expert panellists in. And uh, like I said, you can uh, either send some questions in early or we can do a live Q&A. But we'll guide that discussion uh, from all of them, and even uh, we'll keep that pretty close to an hour as well. But the key one there is balancing fire safety uh, and security that we'll cover off. Um, thank you to our uh, sponsor, AMS Australia. The, that particular monitoring box brochure is available for download. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a video now to close off. Uh, I'm not too sure. I think we'll play the self-latching monitoring box. So it goes for about three minutes. Uh, you can have a look at this and how the design is done. Uh, but thank you otherwise. So this is available, or will be available on our YouTube channel. And also if you're a subscriber to the series uh, or to My Security Media, you'll get it in our newsletters as well. So let me just play this video before closing off. Kevin and Mark, you're welcome to join, uh, to stay on uh, and watch, <laughs> watch me. You might uh, see those extra kilos. The moment I saw it, I thought, okay, I've got to go on a diet. Um, but very interesting in terms of uh, door hardware here as well. So just one second, let me, okay. So this is a video with AMS Australia uh, and I'll play that now, but thank you very much for joining us. And I'll close the session at the end of this video in a few minutes, thank you. In this particular session, we're going to talk about the AMS333 self-latching monitoring box. This is a, your personal design. It's patented here in Australia. Talk us through it. The 333 um, is designed in particular to um, encompass issues with dual lock levers handles. Um, and it's a, it's a situation where we have a problem in high security applications where they need two locks on a security door. Okay, one of the problems that we found, and my background is a locksmith, so um, we used to fit a lot of these security locks to high security applications around Australia. Um, and one of the issues is when you have two locks on the door, as here, which is a security requirement, 
when the top lock is actually, if the top lock was actually locked, the door wouldn't close. And when you've got a situation where you've got a security door and a fire door, there becomes a clash of these specifications. The security says you must have two locks on the door. For high-end security applications yeah. we're talking here. But the fire regulations say you can't put a square bolt deadlock on a fire door. So basically what we've designed here is a, is a product. It's an actually an automatic self-latching micro-switch box. So it's actually a dual function situation. What actually happens is it will take the door with the lock in the thrown position but it will also monitor that bolt when the door closes. And this is specifically for a SCEC endorsed uh, building or that has to meet a SCEC endorsement, yep. but for a fire door to meet the security requirements of that SCEC specification. Predominantly it was designed for a fire door yep. to meet the fire regulations, but it, it, it's, it's more than that, okay? It's a, more, it's a bigger product than that in as much as that any security door that you've got an issue where somebody could inadvertently or deliberately latch the top lock out or throw the top bolt of the top lock out so the door won't close. It's going to be a security breach. Yeah. So basically what we've got here is a situation where you've got somebody who's latched the lock out for deliberate reasons for whatever that might be or alternatively you've got somebody who inadvertently throws that top lock which actually means if it is a fire door or a security door when the door closes it won't latch the, the actual square bolt would hit normally would hit on the door frame and it would hold the door open yeah. so number one for fire obviously fire can go through the door because it's not locked properly it's not secured and obviously for security it's not secured if the doors are closed so the trick here is really a trick to latch correct here. so basically what happens here is when i close the door the latch itself actually retracts so it's a reversal of a normal type of lock yeah. okay whereas a normal type of lock the latch actually retracts in this situation the actual micro switch box latch retracts so because the square bolt deadlock won't retract in itself we have to make this retractable so basically what happens is when the door closes the square bolt latch hits the the, the uh, latch here the striker here they both go in and then the outside pops out which actually locks the door. Okay, that will actually yeah, hold the with door a dead with a dead bolt, yeah. correct? But actually holding the inside uh, plunger yeah. in, which actually gives it its secure value. So the security actually in this area here is actually monitoring that the bolt of the lock is actually thrown. And the other key aspect is that is also alarmed. So correct. Uh, so alarm. that it, exactly, yeah. it's actually alarmed. So basically, what happens is if if this, this actually pulses back to a central security station, which will tell you the door is locked, the door is locked, the door is locked. And of course, as soon as somebody unlocks it, yep. it goes to the opposite, the door is unlocked. So it sends an alarm back. Um, that's actually done through the security system itself, but this product enables it to work that way. But the real key to this product is literally the way the door closes. So in this situation, we've got two locks on the door. The top lock is actually thrown, but when I close the door, they both lock. Now that door is actually locked and dead bolted. Okay. Yeah. So now with that top lock, it's actually in, in real life terms, the lock bolt is actually being monitored as we speak and it's sending a signal back saying, yes, the door is locked. In case of somebody wanting to actually open the door, of course, they can just literally push the handle down on the inside. That. That and I'll show you that. On the other side. I'll show you. I'll show you how this works as well. So that's really one part of, of the product. That product, which is called the AMS 6233, uh, it's an automatic micro switch box. Um, that's only one side of the, the of what we're actually discussing here today.